Good afternoon. Hi, I'm Steve Purnell, and I'm happy to be with you, at least virtually. Perhaps next year I'll be with you in person. This afternoon, I'm going to tell you about an update uh, on our project to uh, test a new varroicidal compound. <clears throat> this uh, work is being done in conjunction with Dr. Erica Plettner, who actually discovered the compound. And uh, this year's presentation has contributions from uh, Robert Liu, who's a new master's student at the University of Alberta, as well as uh, Dr. Stephen Cook with USDA in Beltsville, Maryland. Last year, I think I told you sort of the same introductory slide in that uh, this is nothing new to you. We, we certainly are in a dire circumstance. We really need to find new compounds that are effective against Varroa. This is for a number of reasons, principally because a lot of our tried and true compounds have uh, mite populations that are resistant to them. Uh, we have alternate uh, forms <clears throat> of varroicides. Uh, some of these have health effects for the operator. Uh, some of them have health risks for bees. So ultimately we'd like to find an alternative varroa compound, another tool or arsenal that's safe for bees, that's effective at killing mites and doesn't present undue hazard to the operator. And we're hoping the compound we're working with fills most of these criteria. You may remember last year, I showed you a number of slides uh, that looked like an organic chemi chemistry lecture and I've refrained from showing too many of those again. But just to refresh some of you uh, about where we got to, to the point where we are, uh, Erica is a, is a magnificent uh, um, biochemist and uh, she's a long history of looking at compounds um, that are host feeding deterrents for insects. And she's looked at uh, plant insect interactions. So Erica came, came upon and, and studied a class of compounds that really do serve as a host feeding deterrents for insects. And she was initially looking at an insect called cabbage looper. In this class of compounds she was looking at actually proved to be a very potent feeding deterrent. And in the pictures on the slide, what you can actually see is what happens to a normal leaf that gets consumed by cabbage leaf or, uh, looper rather. Uh, but if we apply certain compounds to the leaf, uh, specifically the compound we're looking at uh, in relation to varroa resistance, we see that cabbage loopers actually don't really consume any of it. So it's based on this body of research really in a related field of science that caused Erica to look at whether this class of compounds would be effective against varroa and deter them from feeding normally on honeybee larvae and pupae. Um, I showed you again last year uh, a number of slides that related to how we proved efficacy of this compound in the lab. Again, a lot of this work was done in the Erica's work at Simon Fraser University. Some was done in our lab in Beaver Lodge as well. But most of these were done with bioassays. So bioassays are, are tests that are used to really determine the effectiveness of the compound in a lab setting. So this is an example of one of the bioassays that Erica used in which she placed uh, two bees actually in a Petri dish uh, with the compound dosed uh, within the Petri dish uh, on a small, on the lid actually. And uh, she actually recorded the behavior of the mites in a number of these dishes over a variety of doses of the compounds. Here in these graphs, you actually see two candidate compounds. One is the one we're interested in, we call 3C36, or sometimes 3C for short, and a close competitor named 3C, 3C66. And from these types of assays, we could determine effective concentrations that would actually kill or par uh, paralyze uh, half the mites in a population, determining these EC50 values, which is a measure of toxicity. And uh, what we determined was that 3C36 was the, the best compound in a suite of compounds actually at disrupting the host finding ability of the mite. So what I really wanna point out here is that 3C36 doesn't actually overtly kill um, mites on contact. What it does is it really changes their behavior in terms of their ability to find a bee and arrest on it and feed it. Most of the mites will be found on the glass dish, they'll have starved. Uh, if they do land on the abdomen of the bee, for example, they'll move off. Whereas if you did this assay and uh, you just put a blank solvent on the top of the dish, the vast majority of those mites would find the bee arrest and actually feed. So 3C36 is a, quite a novel compound. It's not a compound that was used as a miticide uh, in uh, another type of uh, system in agriculture. And it, it really affects the behavior of the mite. It confuses them. It, prevents their arresting behavior and really leads to uh, death and paralysis.
Um, again, this is the results of another bioassay, which really just amplifies what I've just talked about in this particular assay, 3C36. Uh, again, in 3C66, we're both directly applied to mites. In this particular bioassay, we actually had five, or Erica had five bees uh, with mites in a dish and uh, looked at their positioning uh, after a series of time intervals up to six hours and uh, the resulting number of mites that were either paralyzed or dead in that period. And so if you look at 3C36, this blue line, you find an increasing number of mites that were either paralyzed uh, or dead uh, within six hours. Uh, this did increase with dose. And the other thing to point out is with increasing dose, you have fewer mites actually on the abdomen. You have more uh, actually in the blue area, which is the glass, which leads to their death. Uh, and sometimes on another part of the bee, which isn't the abdomen. So it really increases the probability of those mites sort of getting lost, not finding their host and ending up dead in these assays. Well, based on this information, we actually started uh, doing field trials and based on this lab data, but some new information this year I wanna share with you is we've actually shared the compound with uh, our US DA collaborator, that's uh, Stephen Cook. Uh, Steve has been very involved in looking alter at alternative miticides in, uh, with uh, partners, including people like, for instance, uh, Met Hats and, and also Rasul in previous years have screened a wide variety of compounds using a, what I'd like to call a pipeline. So Steve Cook has a, a, an in-lab pipeline that really evaluates compounds of interest. Again, ours is novel and I was very interested in him testing uh, this new compound actually in his pipeline to see whether some of the results in his lab would mirror our experiences in Canada. So it also served as a base to, 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 basis rather to generate some uh, US derived data which perhaps could uh, serve as a, a tool for registration in the future. So these lab tests really look at putting a compound into small laboratory tests, such as in vials or in small jars, uh, and looking at whether they're viable in those settings. And those that are viable in those settings get scaled up for larger field tests and eventual, hopefully, registration. Again, looking at that pipeline that USDA uses, um, they use vials for mite testing. The vials are coated uh, in the miticide of interest. And over a series of doses, um, the compound has to be able to kill mites in a vial. If it doesn't do that, it really does, doesn't go on for further mite testing. If it does kill mites in a vial over a series of doses, it gets ramped up to a small jar test. And based on the data produced in uh, both the vials and the jars, we look at the concentrations of the compound necessary to kill bees and kill mites. And what we're really looking for is a large difference in the concentration needed to kill bees relative to mites. So this concentration to kill bees should be relatively high uh, relative to a small concentration that, that should kill mites. So we're really looking at the big difference uh, in the concentration of the compound that can kill bees and mites. And if that is true, and the compound is able to be synthesized, and for 3C36, our compound of interest, we know it is, from a previous experience, it usually goes on to larger field testing. So again, we're comparing the toxicity data from honeybees and mites and looking at safety and efficacy. And with our compound, that's also been evaluated in some mammalian toxicity assays already. So just to give you a little more of a visual representation of what's actually done in these trials, you see the vials here. These actually contain uh, nine mites and no bees. The jars contain bees, 10 bees in a jar, but no mites to look at mite and uh, then bee toxicity respectively. This then gets scaled up to cages. This is sort of a deli container, contains 250 bees and the compound of interest in our trials, uh, they were applied on sticks actually like tongue depressors. So a portion of tongue depressor actually hung in these cages. And if that all works well on this pipeline, usually the USDA recommendation would be to move up to hives. So I'm gonna share with you some data from vials, jars, and cages uh, that was generated by Steve Cook. So I'm not gonna show you all of it, but what I wanna point out is uh, how 3C36 performed. So these tests I'm showing you here are for four hours against Varroa. So this is actually uh, a cage assay, but I'm showing you the data for mortality for Varroa mites in those cages. And what we can see with increasing dose, this is log dose, so increasing dose, is that we have more and more mites that die. And what we're really looking for is a nice S-shaped or sigmoidal response that shows increasing uh, more, uh, rather lethality with time. So both of these tests after four hours and 24 hours really do show increasing mortality over time. And the 
graphs on the right are a model which better uh, predicts uh, where we can find our EC50 or the median concentration that causes 50% uh, of mite mortality. So we do, do rather do have a good response of this compound uh, in cage tests. I can show you the same data here. Um, here, uh, this is not dead mites. This is dead bees in four hours or in 24 hours. Here again, we see the concentrations used in these cages, which would be the same as the mites as for the mites as the bees. And again, if there was a good dose response effect, we would see a nice S-shaped response. In fact, what we see is a pretty flat line. So what this data is telling us is the compound doesn't really respond to dose, and you don't really have a, a higher, much higher proportion of bees dying with an increased dose. So this is what we actually want to see in terms of bee toxicity. We don't want to see bees dying with increased dose of the compound in this case in 24 hours versus four hours. So based on the predicted values in the model, I can show you uh, what this median concentration, this medium effective concentration that kills, or uh, in this case kills 50% of the population is. So in vials, uh, which I didn't show you the graphs for, uh, it takes about a milligram to two milligrams in four or 24 hours respectively to kill 50% of the population. But in a jar, if we look at the concentration on bees, we see these values are substantially higher. So it takes, uh, you know, in, in the order of 30 times as much of the compound to kill a bee in a jar as compared to a mite in a vial, and about 10 times at 24 hours. This is four versus 24 hours. So these values are substantially higher than these values, which is essentially what we want to see for testing a compound like this. If we look at cage tests, which is the data I showed you just previously, we see it takes um, several milligrams of the compound in a cage to kill 50% of the population. So in four hours, over 100 milligrams, <clears throat> approximately a third or a quarter of that within 24 hours. And if we compare that to bees, and this is bees modeled in the same cage, you see it takes rather huge amounts in terms of milligrams of the compound to kill bees. So because these values are substantially higher uh, than these, this shows us the compound is relatively safe for bees, uh, but it does have doses at which it is highly effective at killing mites. So we're very reassured uh, by these results uh, produced by Steve Cook, and they tend to mirror a lot of the lab bioassays done by uh, Erica and uh, ourselves in our lab. I'm going to move on to talk a little bit about the field trials. So I did tell you about the 2019 field trials last year. So those are the initial field trials we did. I'm just going to quickly show you a slide of this uh, so you might remember. Uh, these field trials were done uh, in the lower mainland of BC. They were done in Beaver Lodge uh, in my lab and also in Israel. <clears throat> they were a 20 colony trial in which we tested the compound against controls, which just contain mites, but no treatment. Again, the uh, sort of setup for this and uh, all of the field experiments are similar. We have a pretrial uh, period in which the compounds, or rather the colonies, are standardized with bees and mites, and we sample them over the season. So that at the beginning of the trial, which was in the fall, we had fairly homogeneous colonies we could allocate to each treatment. Half were treated with 3C, our compound of interest, and half were untreated in this experiment. In this case, in this experiment, they were treated for 30 days. After that time, apivar was introduced and we looked at the remaining mites that uh, were knocked down with apivar to determine efficacy. So um, what I wanna point out in this trial in 2019 is we actually put five grams of 3C into colonies on 10, these are called craft sticks, they look like popsicle sticks that were suspended and hung down actually in between the frames. So they were brought in fairly close contact with the bees and the brood. Uh, five grams was introduced and it was uh, distributed throughout the colony in between uh, in, in the frame spaces. Um, for all of these types of experiments, we're primarily monitoring the sticky boards as you see here. We did do alcohol washes typically uh, before we applied the treatments, after the treatments came out of the colonies and again at the end of the experiment. But most of the mite fall data we've collected is on sticky boards. And again, from our 2019 experiment, and this is just the Beaver Lodge data, you can see <clears throat> we started the experiment, by the way, with about 11% uh, mite load in these colonies. You can see the high knockdown with compound 3C36, which decreases over time, uh, likely as the amount of effective uh, compound 
um, is dissipated uh, out of the applicators. You can see this large peak here when Apivar is first applied and we have uh, a big peak in mite fall as the remaining mites in the colony uh, die over time. You can see many more mites falling out of the controls because there are many more mites in them, fewer mites in the compounds of 3C36. And if you were to calculate efficacy <clears throat> of the mites killed in this period versus the entire treatment period, we'd see about 80% of the uh, mites dying as a result of the treatment by this method of calculation. There are other ways of calculating efficacy. This is a fairly straightforward one. Uh, you can also calculate the number of mites that actually die naturally, and that's almost 30%. But by this measure, you have about 80% efficacy of these compounds in the colony. So we were very encouraged by this. Uh, we did a parallel trial in uh, BC uh, in 2019, uh, and we resumed these trials actually in the fall of 2021. So that's what I wanna to talk to you about now. I'd like to point out that uh, Robert Liu was very involved uh, in these trials as a new MSc student. And also they were well supported uh, by Abdullah Ibrahim working in my lab and also Rasul Bereni who was working up in Beaver Lodge in the summer of 2021. In this particular experiment, it was run very similarly to 2019. We used 3C36. Uh, we only applied four grams per device. I want to point out that uh, the reason for this was because actually in the previous experiment we did residue analysis, Erica actually weighed and determined the amount of 3C remaining on the applicators and there was some still remaining at the end of the experiment. So we felt we could actually apply less of the compound and still achieve uh, the same degree of control as in the previous year. In this experiment we used a negative control which were uh, colonies with mites but no treatment and we also ran Fimovar. I want to point out for those of you that know Thymovar and use it, <laughs> normally in a single you should be applying two strips and you repeat the application after three or four weeks. So I just want to point out to the makers of Thymovar, this is really like half a Thymovar treatment versus our experimental compound. The other big difference this year is the compound was applied on a wooden block, a single wooden block which is applied to the top bars and this was inverted after a period of two weeks. Again, uh, I won't go into all the details here. The experiment was run very, uh, very similarly as to 2019. Pre-experimental setup to standardize the colonies. We applied Thymovar and our compound of interest, 3C36, for a four-week period. After that point in time, um, those compounds were removed and Apovar was brought in as a knockdown treatment to determine efficacy. We did various other measurements during the experiment to look at the size of the brood, uh, the number of adult bees, uh, and uh, we also did alcohol washes at strategic time points. So if we look at the data from 2021 in Beaver Lodge, what we actually see is um, not a pattern that's exactly similar to what we saw in 2019. We didn't see a big peak in the number of mites that dropped when uh, the experimental treatment was put in or with Thymovar for that matter. Uh, we actually saw a slight increase in the drop uh, with 3C36, which is a bit surprising and maybe it may speak to release rate of the compound on the applicator. But in general, what we see is using 3C was better than not treating. Thymovar was slightly better than 3C. And these lines reverse, of course, after the application of Apovar uh, because <clears throat> the untreated colonies had the most mites, 3C had an intermediate number, and Thymovar, uh, relatively speaking, had the least. If we do a similar efficacy calculation as to 2019, we see the efficacy, both of Thymovar, 3C, 36 is approaching 50%, so far lower than we would have liked. Uh, but I think it did teach us some lessons, which I'll talk about uh, very shortly. Um, it also uh, really shows too that uh, we were doing this trial uh, with a fairly high number of mites. It doesn't show this, what we did. We had about a 15% mite load starting this experiment, which was higher than we would have liked, but uh, it also was a significant challenge to the treatments we applied. We have uh, parallel data from the Fraser Valley in 2021. This experiment was run exactly the same, actually coincidentally on exactly the same dates. Uh, we actually found our efficacy was slightly lower, uh, approaching 40% for 3C36 and approaching 60% for Thymovar. So uh, again, we didn't see the performance we would have liked, but the trends between the treatments was very similar. Uh, 3C36 was the intermediate treatment, Thymovar was slightly better. And uh, it's reassuring to know at least the compound is performing similarly in two different geographic areas. But clearly we uh, need to uh, look at how we're applying the compound to see if we can improve the efficacy.
Some other data I'll show you uh, fairly quickly that we measured uh, was just uh, mite loads in adult bees. These are phoretic mite washes. So again, we started the experiment with almost a 15% mite load in beaver lodge, higher than we would have liked. We would have tried to shoot for more like the 5% range, but sometimes managing mites in colonies is more of an art than a science. Uh, also point out the economic threshold is usually 3% or above uh, for early fall with brood on the prairies. So uh, the treatment did not reduce, um, none of either of the two treatments reduced mite loads below the threshold, but after the application of Apovar, they were brought down to um, what would have been a threshold in the early fall. So again, uh, fairly high mite numbers, which uh, weren't substantially dropped down uh, by day 28 after treatment. Uh, secondly, we did look at the area of sealed brood. Uh, this is sealed brood on the left and open brood on the right on the beginning of the experiment and four weeks later. Uh, we didn't quite get the standardization we wanted with sealed brood. It's very hard to get everything quite exact when you're standardizing colonies and not interchanging frames so as to mix up the mite loads between colonies. Uh, but similar uh, areas of sealed brood, um, the same areas of open brood and colonies, but what we were really, really looking for at the end of the experiment were differences between these treatment groups. We really didn't see them. So this may suggest that the presence of 3C36 or thymol that far for that matter didn't uh, affect brood production in these colonies over the experiment. And also similarly, we looked inside uh, cat brood cells for the, uh, the numbers of mites inside brood. This was standardized at the start of the experiment and actually increased by day 28, where really we saw most of the mites moving into the cat brood um, because the amount of cat brood in the uh, colony greatly decreased. We had a high mite load and the cells were very highly infested because of relatively number of, uh, of small uh, sealed brood cells in the colony. But again, no differences between treatment, which is one thing we were uh, really looking at as well or between the controls. And finally, looking at the overall worker bee population, uh, again, this is measured in frame sides, by the way, so one side of one frame as it was in the previous uh, slides. Uh, no differences on day zero and really no differences between treatments before and after population. So the brood population, rather the worker bee population is smaller on day 28, but there's not a differences, difference between treatments, which suggests there's not an adverse effect of the treatment actually on um, uh, on the colony population size or the other metrics we measured. So I think in summary, I just want to say that uh, we continue to do a lot of work and we're still uh, actively working um, on a few other uh, samples uh, actually taken from these compounds and will follow these um, same colonies rather uh, in the following summer. I think what we've really reinforced this year is that um, 3C36 is a very effective compound in an independent set of lab assays that was done with our collaborators at USDA. Uh, so it takes very little of <clears throat> uh, the compound to kill mites, but a much higher amount actually to kill bees. So that ratio between bees and mites is very uh, great, which is what we want to see. A higher EC50 for bees and a low EC50 uh, for mites. Um, we did not see any overt harmful effects in bees or brood. That's something we can continue to monitor, but we certainly didn't see reductions in brood area or reductions in bees relative to the other treatments in our experiment. I'm just gonna pause here and talk a little bit about the lack of efficacy. Um, it would always be great to get uh, huge efficacy numbers, but I think what this really showed us this year in both uh, Beaver Lodge and BC is that we have to increase the dose we're applying to the colonies and also extend the duration of the treatment period. So uh, when I've Talk to Erica about this. I think we've come to agreement that uh, even though in early on trials, we thought a four week treatment period might be sufficient to knock down mite populations, we're gonna have to extend that to a standard six week treatment period and actually reapply the compound on a new applicator after three weeks. As Erica uh, is a chemist, she's looking at formulating uh, these treatment applicators so they'll actually have a greater release rate initially, at least that's her desire. So. I think in our next field trial, we'll really adjust the way we actually apply the compound to the colonies. And uh, I think this should make a difference in uh, the amount of efficacy we see in the, uh, in the field trials coming up uh, in the next field season. We do have much other data uh, and some other lab uh, studies we're going to be doing. We're going to be, we're going to be looking at the uh, efficacy of the compound against mites that are actually in the brood, or at least I'm hoping Robert will be able to look at that. Uh, we do have data coming up on wintering survival and a heads up, I think our colonies will not survive very well because of their high mite load. That may be independent of treatment. 
Uh, and we're also very carefully looking at what we call incurred residue levels in honey, or that's the amount of the compound in honey, which is a very important thing to measure uh, for potential registration of the compound. So we're set up to do additional uh, large-scale field trials in the fall of 2022 and the spring of 2023. And we hope some of the lessons we've used from this field season will uh, improve our efficacy and uh, have us learn more about the effects of the compound on the colony as a whole. So I'd like to thank everybody uh, a lot uh, for their work. Um, Erica has a big team uh, over the last uh, couple of years we've done field trials. I'd like to again shout out to Abdullah and Rasul for their hard work, Carlos for some of his previous lab bioassay work in our lab, uh, the summer students, Catherine and Johnson and uh, Robert, who's uh, just starting in on this project this summer. And I'm sure we'll have um, many more presentations to you uh, in the future. And a big thank you to our funders, uh, particularly the Canadian Bee Research Fund, Bee Made Honey, and a big thank you to Project APSM and the Alberta Beekeepers for funding this work. And we hope to continue to find answers for you. Thank you very much.